you guys so much for coming. It's nice to see you in person. We're in for a real treat today. Delighted to have Dr. Heilig. I'm only going to say that he's really one of my role models for his incredible science, but also for his perspective as a clinician. So we're going to get both of that, the top-notch science and the application to humans who struggle with addiction. So I'm going to let Dr. Grodin give a more proper introduction. Dr. Grodin has had the pleasure of working with um, Dr. Heilig uh, during her time in the NIDA Intramural Research Program. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm gonna give a try to be brief introduction, although I think I could spend the whole time reading um, Marcus's bio and accolades and various memberships. Um, but to be brief, uh, Dr. Heilig received his MD and PhD from uh, Lund University in Sweden. Uh, then he was a postdoc with uh, Dr. Kube at the Scripps Research Institute, uh, pretty close to here. Uh, he went back to Sweden for a bit, and then he became the uh, director of the Intramural Clinical and Translational Research Program at NIAAA, which is where I got a chance to work with him. Um, in 2015, uh, Sweden stole him back uh, to work at, I'm sorry, I'm about to butcher this. <laughs> I've worked with Swedes for many years and I, the language is not uh, good for me. Uh, Link Chopin <laughs> University job. as the founding director of a center on uh, social and effective neuroscience. And this was a major initiative so, supported by the Swedish Research Council. Um, and his program of studies uh, studies uh, brain mechanisms behind uh, addiction and other anxiety disorders using translational approaches. So. Marcus uses approaches all the way from uh, animal methods to humans, um, and he is uh, widely published and cited. He has published over 300 peer review papers in publications including Science, PNAS, The Lancet, um, yielding over uh, 25,000 citations with an H index of 88. Um, he is a member of many uh, organizations, including uh, a fellow of uh, the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology, a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Uh, he's an editor at Neuropsychopharmacology and a scientific advisor to the Swedish Medical uh, Products Agency. He has won numerous awards and I'm not gonna read them all, but some of them include uh, uh, the Neuropsychopharmacology Award from the European College of Neuropsychopharmacology, uh, the Biomedical, um, sorry, the Manfred uh, Leutenschlager European Alcohol Research Award, the H. David Archibald Award, uh, as well as the Dan Anderson Research Award. And uh, we're really excited to have him here today to tell us about the neurobiological mechanisms of individual vulnerability to alcohol addiction-like behaviors. Hi, my name is Marcus and I'm a psychiatrist. Uh, listen, thank you for the kind introduction. Thanks a lot, Lara, Erica, for inviting me. It's just such an amazing, exhilarating feeling to come out of hibernation and rediscover how important it is to get inspired by colleagues in, in the field. And among those, I have to say my host today is one of the most creative and wonderful people to whom I look for the future of our field. So uh, it's, it's really a lot of fun to be here. Um, and then of course, I'll try to provoke you a little because otherwise I wouldn't be me, but we'll have to, um, to get to that in a moment. For now, this is what I'm gonna be talking about. This is the center where I work now and I'll mention a couple more words about it before I do. These are my disclosures. Uh, I guess uh, this is the most amusing one. You can, um, I could spend some of my time talking about the surprise of having federal agents visit your neighbors once you achieve a certain level at the NIH and telling your neighbors that they're from the FBI and they would like to run a background check on their neighbor. Uh, what's news to me, it's a past year. <laughs> I'm back in Europe and my security clearance is done. Um, 
So, you know, I never used to spend time talking about much about where we are when I worked at the Karolinska in Stockholm, and then for, for one decade, and then one decade at the National Institutes of Health Intramural Research Program. Uh, since then, I, I figured we probably better show a map. So this is Sweden. This is where we are in this small town uh, of Linköping, two hours south of Stockholm. Well, really, two, if six years ago, we started building from scratch a center that re really is unusual in the sense that it's not really just about addiction. It's not just about psychiatry. Even my partner in crime, Håkan Olauson, is the chair of clinical neurophysiology and is interested in sensory physiology in how we communicate social information through touch and things of that nature. So it's really a zoo and I like it that way. But uh, the, 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 the people who work mostly on addiction are listed here. And among those, you will see a basic science team an experimental medicine team. So that's of course the building blocks for being able to address the questions of alcohol addiction and other addictions in a translational manner. And among these these people, the people who are highlighted are those who have been key to the stories that I will uh, tell you about today. So a lot of the work is in, in rats, but there's, there's a very uh, conscious effort to try to translate that into humans and use that for developing new mechanistically based treatments. So, you know, I, I've been around for a while and uh, this is when I did my postdoc and the alcohol neuroscience wasn't much of a thing. So I decided to ignore it, uh, work on stress and anxiety. About 10 years later, uh, neuroscience of addiction and neuroscience of alcohol addiction was beginning to pick up. We were in the decade of the brain and really there was a start of a tremendous expansion of neuroscientific understanding of mechanisms underlying addiction related behaviors. So that's when it got so exciting, I figured I'd better jump in. And intellectually, it's been a fantastic ride. And methods-wise, it's been a fantastic ride. We've, we've had opportunities to use tools that have allowed us to ask questions that were impossible to, to ask. Manip selectively identify and manipulate the activity of specific brain circuits while animals are carrying out behavior. Someone had told me that while I was in medical school, I would probably have said science fiction or I would have looked for my Haldol injection. Nevertheless, uh, with all this enormous expansion that's been so, so inspiring scientifically, clinical progress really has lagged behind. And so, you know, I take this as a personal failure because this is the year I got recruited to the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism to uh, develop a medications, a translational medications development program. And of course, until then, at least there had be, been three mechanistically distinct pharmacotherapeutics approved for the treatment of alcohol addiction. And ever since I set foot in the field, there's been zero. Uh, I just hope that correlation in this case at least isn't causation, but who knows? So, so very clearly we have work to do. And so, Oops, that's going the wrong way. Um, and, and, you know, it's particularly frustrating since we've had great hopes and expectations. There was a time during my uh, tenure at the NIH when we thought we were fairly close. There was fantastic basic neuroscience identifying promising targets in animal models. And we were beginning to develop approaches through experimental medicine to try to translate these advances into human therapeutics. And, uh, you know, so this was obviously the, the, the top candidate we had. It was a great pleasure for me as a former postdoc of George Koops to be part of that effort. And it was therefore the greater, the, dis the even greater disappointment when this top candidate we had didn't pan out, or at least so far hasn't. And it's been uh, not like there's anything wrong with us in the addiction field uh, specifically because the failures have been just as disappointing and as perplexing in other stress-related disorders such as depression, generalized, in general, anxiety disorders where hopes for CRH1 antagonists have been great and where things didn't work out clinically. So when I moved back, 
to Sweden to start up the new lab, the new center with some brave souls betting their scientific careers on a big unknown, we sat down and tried to think about, you know, where do we go next? And this was really a tremendous opportunity to rethink our approaches and start asking ourselves, what might we have been missing? I mean, you know, that, that was one strategy. The other strategy might, would have been to do what Steve Hyman said, just conclude basic science and animal models in particular are useless, let's just stop doing them. Uh, but since I didn't quite know how we would do target identification and, and validation instead, um, we, we thought that was kind of extreme. So looking specifically at, at animal work, trying to identify potential targets for novel treatments, we, the first thing that strikes you is, so self-administration has been the standard model since the classic work, let's arbitrarily pick Roy Wise, but there are others before him, of course. You know, it's the model to, to Roy, an animal pressing a lever to receive a drug reinforcer was equal to an animal model of addiction. And that was good in many ways because it captured the phenomenon that all addictive substances for humans are indeed self-administered by animals in these types of operant models. But if you stop and think about it, there were some aspects that we probably could have realized already at the time were less good. So one of those was that you buy 50 rats, you, you train them on operant self-administration and all of them will self-administer. The two or three guys that don't learn, we just get annoyed at, sack them and move on with our experiments as if they didn't exist. Uh, secondly, we typically study self-administration under what I will call here single reinforcer conditions, basically the only uh, program consequence available to, to the rat through an, emitting an operant response is receiving the drug reward. And the alternative to that is doing nothing or best case scenario, pressing a pass, an inactive lever that won't deliver anything. And then finally, uh, when animals leave a press for alcohol, uh, they receive the alcohol and they get to experience the, the reinforcing properties of the drug and that's end of story. That is not how clinical alcohol addiction looks like. So in the real world of alcohol addiction, there are at least three very fundamental facts that we have to pay attention to that markedly differ from what I just outlined to you. So first, this is stuff we've known ever since Jim Anthony's classical epidemiological studies. It's been replicated over and over, but I like to go to the source. So this is Anthony's data. And you see that among regular users and this, this particular set of studies, it was regular users over a period of two years. At, at the end of it, only a minority shows sign, signs of having developed addiction. Now it's a significant minority, it's a minority within which the suffering is tremendous and that causes a lot of pressure on clinical services, but nevertheless, it's a minority. And even if you look at the substance so addictive as this, uh, heroin, that percentage number is about 23, 25%. If you look at alcohol, it's about 15, okay? So unless we take that in account and we treat every rat as if they were all the same for their motivation to seek and take alcohol, it's going to be very hard to capture the factors that make the vulnerable minority vulnerable. Secondly, and any clinician, any patient, and any, any family member of a patient will know this, addiction does not only involve increasing your drug intake. It involves choosing the drug over healthy rewards, over being together with your family, over engaging in a hobby, over other healthy rewards that hopefully are available to most people, although that certainly, as we know, is not true for everybody. And that is a concern that I will return to. So again, uh, very hard to understand how we would be able to capture the mechanisms that make an individual choose drug over healthy rewards in a model where the only uh, re reinforcer available is the drug. 
And thirdly, uh, again, any clinician, any family member will recognize that a hallmark of clinical addiction is not just taking a lot of alcohol. It's because actually there are people who do that and they visit their GP and they're advised that their liver enzymes are elevated or their blood pressure is up and they receive a brief intervention telling them this and they go home and they reduce their consumption. And through that, they dramatically reduce, by the way, both their morbidity and in fact, the risk of dying. So those people can do that because they're not addicted. And the hallmark of addiction is that despite knowing that there are these serious adverse consequences that, are, that you're up against, you are unable to control the drinking. So a lot of people call this compulsive drinking. I know Nick Gilpin and others in the field don't like that. I don't particularly subscribe to that, to that terminology either, but it's convenient because it's short and a lot of people use it. So, you know, operationally defined continued use despite severe adverse consequences, which is a diagnostic criteria criterion. And the longer I work clinically, the more I, I, I draw the conclusion that this is one of the core features of the clinical syndrome. So, you know, it's, it's, it's good to observe these key phenomena in patients. And I think that is a necessity, but then we need to reverse translate this in order to get mechanistic because except for Erica, Clara, and a few select people in the field, it's very difficult to get mechanistic in humans. And even for those who try the best, there are limitations for obvious reasons, ethical, technical, and others. So, uh, but I'll also show you that there are ways you can connect those levels. So, so, so this actually will start out with, with humans. Uh, so I said that addiction involves choosing drug over non-drug rewards. Uh, I'll show you the rat, rat data that really dro drove that research line in our lab, but I actually do it backwards because I'll show you a paradigm which we have since developed in humans where people work for points that will at the end either earn them their personalized choice of an alcohol uh, reward or a I wouldn't call this a healthy re uh, normal reward, but at least a, nat a natural reward. And so one observation that Irene Perini uh, has made, and we stole this from Lee Hogarth in Great Britain, who uh, did this in a bunch of college kids there. We, we've, Irene has improved on this model tremendously, and she has also redesigned it so it's now suitable for uh, brain imaging, which is the next thing we're doing with this. But already in this behavioral study, you can see, so this is audit, this is the World Health Organization instrument for assessing, uh, you know, alcohol use severity in people. And you can see that you can really capture this choice preference under mutually exclusive discrete choice conditions in humans in such a way that it very nicely shows that the people who are at the low end of drinking and drinking problems in the wild might choose alcohol to a very small extent. The people who are at the high end uh, do just the opposite. So this really uh, shows you, and this requires a lot of tweaking of the parameters that I don't have time to talk about, but once you get it right, the, the correlation is, is just tremendous. So, of course, this is based on the work that Eric did in the lab. We, so we got Eric from Serge Ahmed in Bordeaux, who reintroduced to neuroscience in the early 2000s, I would say, an old concept that really, you know, emphasizes the fact that it's hard to understand motivation to seek and take drug in the absence of alternative rewards. And, and Serge, of course, ran those classical studies where, where rats would self-administer cocaine emitting hundreds, close to a thousand liver presses per session. And you'd think they're as addicted as they come. And then he introduces as an alternative re reinforcer, a sweet solution, and all the rats stop liver pressing for cocaine. Okay, so in this case, Eric picks up exactly the model that, that Serge developed. So this is, uh, there's a sampling phase. Uh, so first we train the rats to self-administer on regular self-administration. Once they're trained, they go into this. They learn quickly that one of the levers will deliver alcohol, the other saccharine. And then they go into this choice phase. And basically if they choose the alcohol lever, they'll get that reinforcer, but the other lever is retracted, so it's no longer available, and you keep running this over and over and over and over again. 
And what happens is Eric's a very brave guy because, you know, from the first experiment, I think he had three rats that would choose alcohol. Everyone else chose the sweet solution. But once you accumulate these hundreds and hundreds of animals, a very clear uh, pattern emerged in which there was a cluster of, of rats that did not behave the way the majority did. So the majority would consistently choose the the natural reward, the sweet solution, but the minority would go for alcohol. And so we actually, this hasn't been published yet for, we're about to publish it finally now. As, as we did this work, we, <clears throat> we ran a sanity check because this was new to us. And so we figured, how do we convince ourselves that this means something? Well, we had been working for a long time with a model in which by having rats inhale alcohol vapor and go through cycles of intoxication and withdrawal for a long time, seven weeks, we thought we would be able to induce a number of neuro adaptations that result in behaviors that are addiction-like. So I, I don't have time to go into what those are, but it's really a very broad pattern of increased es escalation of self-administration, increased motivation on progressive ratio schedules, et cetera, et cetera. So we thought if this new choice model it means what we think it means, the testable prediction is that if we induce dependence by vapor exposure, then the proportion of the population that chooses alcohol over the natural reward should increase. And indeed, that is exactly what you see here. So in the absence of exposure, you have the 15% that I already showed you, but once you, uh, once you uh, induce dependence, you, know, the, you do that and then you allow with acute withdrawal to dissipate, we're not interested in, in what that does to, to individuals. We're, so, yep, you, it shifts upwards 50%. So with that, we, we thought we had something that meaningfully reflects this shift in motivation from natural reward to alcohol. And so with that, we put in a considerable effort for a molecular discovery uh, project. This was just before we switched over to RNA sequencing. So this is run on our nanostring platform. I have to say all the kids in the lab love RNA sequencing. I kind of in secret still love nanostring. And the reason is because it's so highly quantitative, sensitive, linear over a number of, of orders of magnitude, but I'm outvoted. No, you know, they, they don't like to feel old fashioned like this. So Gonna have the, if you want to be a cool kid, you need to use the cool to tools. I, I, I get that. But if even with this no longer very cool tool, it's very obvious that the differential gene expression uh, that happens, or rather that distinguishes the rats that choose alcohol over the natural reward is pretty much confined to an old friend of mine, which is the amygdala, while very little is going on in other brain areas we screen through. And within that structure, we ran a pathway analysis and immediately it jumped out that we had a pathology of a GABAergic pathway. And the pathology is such that there's a whole family of transporters that are low expressed. And there's also a number of receptors, uh, receptor subunits that are low expressed. We think this is the primary pathology such that uh, downregulation of the transporters uh, results in impaired clearance of GABA. As a result, you have excessive GABAergic inhibition. As a result, the postsynaptic receptors downregulate. It remained for quite some time a mystery to me why we saw this broad downregulation of a number of transporters. We think we finally figured it out and it's been staring me in the face and I'm just embarrassed I didn't see it because these guys share, this is a gene family. So they have a fair amount of sequence homology, including sequence homology in regulatory sites. So we were trying to look for the causes of the differential expression by sequencing the promoter of the GAT3 gene, which was the most prominent downregulation we saw and didn't find anything. But of course, if you realize that this is probably a shared effect across a number of gene family members, then the whatever factor it is that's driving it has got to be upstream and there's got to be a different transcription factor activity that 
broadly affects this whole family. So we're now whole genome sequencing 100 rats with high coverage, 50 of each kind, uh, choosers versus non-choosers, trying to find the, and we have a couple of signals, but that's, that's really only now being done. So this was an unexpected convergence. I, you know, I have so Marisa Roberto, who's a good friend and a wonderful scientist, had been trying to tell me for a long time there's something wrong with GABAergic uh, transmission in the central nucleus of rats as they develop dependence, but I just couldn't understand it because it was so counterintuitive because she was talking about elevated GABA in the central nucleus and how could that have anything to do with addiction? We know that's anxiolytic, so it's just... I just can't understand it. And it's electrophysiology, by the way, and I have a blind spot for electrophysiology. So, well, that was not very smart, but at least at this, you know, once we got to this point, it became pretty clear that we needed to ask Marisa what the hell this might mean. And so I'll come to that. But first, the, you know, the, the, the core of, of, of this project was, of course, establishing that it is this GABAergic dysregulation that is causally related to the excessive choice of alcohol over uh, natural rewards. And this, without spending too much time on the, on the technical details, we did using a viral gene knockdown strategy. So basically, you take rats that are in the majority, they don't choose alcohol over natural reward, and then you... if you, meaning Estelle Barbier in the lab, design an shRNA knockdown vector that you deliver through an AAV virus. Once you do that, you see a very nice downregulation of the transcript for the transporter. So now you've created rats that at a molecular level in the amygdala look like the rats that spontaneously chose alcohol. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happens with these guys. So we basically create the phenocopy or we, we can mimic the the, the excessive choice by, by this manipulation. And finally, in, in, in this part, we convinced ourselves that this might actually have some translational validity because uh, it was kind of funny because reviewers asked us, this looks nice, but could you show it in you know, three additional models, uh, animal models of, of alcohol addiction? And we looked at this, uh, who cares about more rat data? Uh, humans are the important thing. And so we got uh, post-mortem brain tissue from, from the Australian Brain Bank, which is a wonderful resource for the whole field. And lo and behold, uh, people who had died after having been diagnosed with alcohol addiction had this low expression of this GABA transporter in the central nucleus of amygdala as well. So, so that's part one. So we, we so looking for individual vulnerability we and for this phenotype of choosing alcohol over natural rewards we ended up with a molecular pathology of the of gabaergic signaling in the central nucleus of the amygdala and i'll leave it there and uh, move on to part two and you'll see it'll lead us right back to the same place so this actually starts with erica grodin's wonderful work as a graduate student at the NIAAA while still with that program. Erica ran this heroic study where she had uh, light drinkers and heavy drinkers come into the lab, select how much they would tolerate being shocked on the wrist, if I remember correctly, uh, and then play this game where they could press for points to obtain alcohol uh, or something else. And they could do that in three different, in three different conditions one that was safe, one that was associated with a low probability of being shocked, and one that was associated with a high probability of being shocked. And, you know, there's a ton of wonderful stuff in that paper that I recommend everyone to, to, to read. The one simple observation that I will highlight here is that very similar to what I showed you for choice, there was this very robust correlation between, uh, in this case, uh, scores on the the compulsive scale of the obsessive compulsive drinking uh, scale in the wild and the likelihood that people would lever press for alcohol points under conditions of adverse consequences. Okay, so very similar to what you see for choice. And so again, trying to reverse translate those observations, S.E. Domi, at that time a postdoc in the lab, now 
as of a couple of weeks, faculty at the University of Camerino in her native Italy, uh, Essie ran a similar heroic effort to the one that Eric had run for choice, but now for compulsive or aversion resistant alcohol self-administration. And she used, uh, as so again, train up rats to straight up self-administer alcohol in an operant conventional paradigm. Once that is done and they're stable, you introduce now the, the punishment, which is a mild electric foot shock. And if you had done what we had done previously and what many other labs have done, and we would have stopped right there because if we had just looked for the first few days, there really doesn't seem to happen much other than there is a normal distribution of sensitivity to punishment for, for, uh, for continuing to liver press. The trick is to keep going. And it turns out that the individual vulnerability emerges only over time. And so this is really beautiful because you see this unimodal distribution here, keep doing this for two weeks and you get this nice separation into two populations. In this case, the vulnerable population is a bit larger than, than the one for choice. And by the way, they do overlap. We had that in the science paper that Eric, Eric put out with the choice data uh, already, but we didn't really systematically study it the way we, we do here. So we knew that the animals that choose uh, alcohol over the sweet solution also were liver pressing despite negative consequences, namely this foot shock. But in, there seems to be, it seems that those are a subset of a somewhat larger subset, about one third of animals that will be compulsive. So, you know, it's overlapping populations. It might be a parametric thing. It might be that you need to titrate the parameters of the respective model to really make the two populations match up. But it's very nice to see at least that they are overlapping and they're completely overlapping. So every choosing rat is a compulsive rat. Not every compulsive rat is a choosing rat. Okay, so this is what it looks like uh, in, in a when presented somewhat differently, what happens once you've pulled out through, and this is by the way, unsupervised clustering. So we don't tell the computer anything. It's just these two clusters come out. And then we look at, at the self-administration rates under punished conditions over time. And in one cluster, you see this behavior that you probably would expect. This is the majority, the two thirds of the rats that, that really when negative consequences are introduced, uh, they've been to the GP, they've been told that their liver enzymes are, are high, they've gone home and stopped drinking. Uh, these guys couldn't care less. So, okay, uh, what's driving this? So we embark on this really heroic mapping effort. And in order to understand how heroic Essie's work was, you need to appreciate that trying to figure out the neuronal activity that's associated specifically with compulsivity requires you to parse out or control for neuronal activity that's associated non-specifically with being shocked. And that's considerable. You shock a rat, lots of neurons are gonna fire and express false. So now you need to run yoked controls and you need to subtract those from those that voluntarily lever pressed to, in order to get alcohol despite getting shocked. So what you see here is the analysis that controls for uh, expression in response to shock and is specific for the compulsive self-administration. And we basically do this massive serial sectioning, FOS sustaining and counting, and I could show you bar graphs up and down of individual structures. But, you know, we, we also in another life do brain imaging. We, we think networks rather than individual brain structures. So we try to get, obviously, we can't think networks over time here because the rat's dead. But, uh, but we can at least try to get at patterns of coordinated activity. So what we do here is we just run a large uh, principal component extraction and you get these two factors that come out and seem to be independent of each other. And within one of them, network one, you see uh, these structures, the ba basolateral amygdala, the infralimbic cortex, the 
orbitofrontal cortex, prelimbic cortex. And then you see this other one and uh, you see the structures in here. And the thing is that SE really didn't want the activity that mattered to be in central amygdala because that territory was already taken by Eric and every postdoc wants to have their own brain structure to work on in the lab. Uh, so she was devastated because what turned out to be the case is that it was this network that encompasses central nucleus and a few other structures that I'm in love with these days. Uh, it was that the activity of that network that differentiated the compulsive and the non-compulsive rats. This uh, network didn't, didn't differ. But, I mean, it's activated, but doesn't distinguish between the two populations. Uh, and it actually gets, you know, so after all that, this, this made me laugh. So we go through this elaborate exercise. And if we hadn't been so eager to stay away from the central nucleus, we could have saved ourselves quite a bit of work because you go straight to the central nucleus and you look at neuronal activity in that structure and the correlation between the activity only in that one node and the compulsive behavior is 70%. So 70% of the variance of behavior is accounted for by the activity in central amygdala. I've never seen data like this over my 30 years in this business. So, okay, that's fine and well, but it's one thing to show that there is a correlation between neuronal activity in the central nucleus and compulsive alcohol self-administration. We're past the age of correlational neuroscience. We gotta be causal and mechanistic. So, <clears throat> so this was a bit of a challenge and I have to tell you why uh, we initially approached this using a completely different methodology to tag, but, but basically first on a conceptual level. So what's the task here? The task is to bring online, tag, and then selectively manipulate the ensemble of central nucleus cells that potentially, according to our hypothesis, is driving this behavior, right? So that's not all that challenging these days in a mouse. It's a lot more challenging in a rat where a lot of the, of the basic molecular genetic tools and line driver lines are not available. So we actually first tried to approach this using Bruce Hope's down node two uh, method and which actually, which worked, uh, but um, for various reasons, we ended up going, to, we, we tested this as the science fiction option and the science fiction option worked. Uh, so what happens here is you, you train these guys on self-administration, you introduce the compulsive uh, element here. So shock is turned on, you, you select out the animals that are compulsive. And now you inject this, uh, this animal with two vectors. So one of these, it will express a modified Cree recombinase, but only under the control of the FOS promoter. So what, what this means is only when the cell gets activated and tries to express FOS, will the, the activity of this promoter be turned on and Cree will be expressed. But this is a modified Cree, so it's incomplete and it won't do anything unless you also administer an activator, which in this case is tamoxifen. So once you, but if you have expressed, or if you're a cell and you have expressed this Cre and in sufficient quantities, and then you inject the animal with tamoxifen, now this Cre will uh, gain its enzymatic activity and it will uh, be able to express its, its uh, its ability to, re to induce recombination. And the specific recombination event we're after here is in the other vector, which got injected simultaneously, which flips this cassette. And this cassette, uh, which contains a synthetic receptor and an inhibitory dread has been inert up till now, but now it becomes expressed and it expresses this synthetic receptor that still doesn't do anything. However, now we've tagged the ensemble. Right, And so every cell that was active while the animal was compulsively lever pressing despite adverse consequences, now expresses this, uh, this inhibitory dread. And the testable prediction in this case is 
Now, if we inject the animal with a ligand that activates the inhibitory dread, and if that ensemble really was driving causally the behavior, the behavior should be attenuated or abolished, right? So that's what we do. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happens. So you only need to really look at these two bars. So what happens here is this is these guys happily lever pressing despite having expressed the, the dread because the dread you know, is inert in and of itself. So the ensemble is tagged, but we're not doing anything to the ensemble. The rats are still happily lever pressing about 20 times per session despite receiving shock. Now we give them CNO, which activates the, the dread ban. Okay. And we have a we have a resistance score, which so this is resistance to punishment, and you can see that that also is uh, is influenced in the the right the predict pattern. I need to speed up a little bit, so you know. So okay, who are these guys? We have an ensemble of cells that promote compulsive alcohol self administration, but who are they? Well, it turns out they're old friends as well. They're called the PK express PKC delta, which is a signaling enzyme. Uh, they uh, I'll show you the. the what category that puts them in. But basically, this is a very clear observation. Every false positive cell in the ensemble is a PKC delta cell and no false, uh, no false positive cell is, is a somatostatin positive cell, which would have made the members of another neuronal population in another microcircuit. So this takes us to this organization of, of, of the structure, which, which really, I, this is kind of old fashioned already, but uh, Andreas Luti is one of my heroes. And so in a couple of nature papers, he outlined this organization of cells in the central lateral division of the central nucleus, such that you have these guys, th th these are both GABAergic cell populations, by the way, but these also express somatostatin and they're called fear on cells. I don't know that that's the proper name anymore, but what they do is they drive outputs out of the central nucleus as an effector through the bed nucleus of Sriata minalis and also directly probably to the brainstem, for instance, the PAG. And then you have this population, they're called fear off cells. So if you have animals that are freezing because they learned to associate a tone to a shock, and you activate the fear of cells, they'll stop freezing. So that's what they're, why, what, why they're called what they are. So all of our ensemble cells are here, and you can now imagine that this is coming together. So this is removing a break on behavioral inhibition, which is exactly what you would expect uh, for a mechanism that makes a rat approach a lever and press it for alcohol, despite the fact that bad things are gonna happen. Uh, and so it, we just, you know, we use just, we just use this as a phenotypic marker of those cells and didn't think much of it. But then someone in the lab pointed out, wait a second, isn't PKC delta a signaling and en an, an enzyme that's involved in intracellular signaling? Maybe it's actually doing something, not just labeling cells for us. And so we ran back, designed, uh, actually we didn't, this one we didn't decide. We got from Bob Messing, a good friend. At University of Texas in Austin, a knockdown vector for PKC delta itself. We knock down PKC delta, uh, like you can see here, and it's a very busy graph. This one, but all you need to do is look at this. These are the compulsive rats. If you knock down PKC delta, they drop down. They stop being compulsive. The non-compulsive guys are not affected. So it's it's not just that these cells are critical for compulsive self-administration. It's actually the PGC delta itself that's involved in the signaling that goes to that being the case. All right, final, I, yeah, final will be five minutes. I hope we'll, we'll be good on time. So let me, so this was part two, the compulsivity thing. Uh, part three, trying to put it together. So, you know, you go back to the to Eric's findings on pathological alcohol choice associated with low GAT3 expression in the central nucleus, elevated GABAergic inhibition and aberrant choice. Uh, Reiner Spanagel writing the commentary said what we were talking about in the lab that, uh, and I think we actually wrote it in the paper as well. It's very difficult to imagine. I mean, you know, 
conceptually it'd be nice to say, well, let's rescue this low expression of GAT3 and that should rescue the behavior. The problem with that is there is no known pharmacological mechanism to increase the expression or activity of a transporter. There are some attempts with the dopamine transporter that modestly promising, but that's really far into the future, if ever. So I don't know how to accomplish this. But a crude way of achieving something very similar might be to put a break on release of GABA in the structure by activating presynaptic GABA B receptors. And of course, that takes us to the story of baclofen because, uh, you know, at that point, we look at each other and say, oh, great, we've rediscovered the wheel because my colleague and very good friend Lorenzo Leggio and his Italian friends in those days already published that ages ago, 2007, without knowing the mechanism, they demonstrated that activating GABA B receptors in severely alcohol addicted individuals was beneficial. And this has been replicated. It's been debated as well. And I, I think the latest paper by J.C. Garbutt in Neuropsychopharm that just came out nails it. And if you look at the meta-analysis, even prior to that, it's actually pretty conclusive. So there's no question that baclofen works, but uh, baclofen is what I would like to call a tool compound, really more than a treatment. Uh, first of all, from a practical perspective, there's no path to commercialization. It's been off path in so long, you can't do much with it. But also it has real weaknesses uh, and, and obstacles, uh, it's an orthostatic agonist. And if you, everybody who does pharmacology knows if you keep kicking a G protein coupled receptor with a straight up agonist day after day, it's going to downregulate your health tolerance, you have to escalate doses. And that's indeed what's happened. And once you escalate the doses to really high levels, the side effects kick in and there's been mortality in those cases. And this is why the European Medicines Agency said no to approve uh, alcohol addiction as an indication for baclofen. But there are efforts underway to circumvent the limitations of baclofen. And those efforts involve positive allosteric modulators of GABA-B receptors. Uh, and you know, I don't have time to go into the data, so you'll just have to take my word for it chronic administration of this type of, of molecule will not result in tolerance and downregulation of the receptor and will also have a better separation between non-specific non side effects versus the, the effects we're after. So this is again unpublished data, just getting it ready for publication if Indivior allows us. Uh, so, you know, having established the choice model, we we thought, well, all right, if this is really, uh, if, if GABA B receptor activation is uh, promising for rescuing pathological choice, then a GABA B PAM should do that. And that's exactly what you see here. So these are the choosing rats, and this is the, this is the dose dependent rescue. And you can see that the non-choosing rats really are not affected. And this is doses that don't affect sedation or anything. Likewise, uh, and here we actually, this is, the tool compound nature of baclofen. We, we ran out of the PAM and we were, now we're working with the PAMs, but the initial data were with baclofen. You see that also for compulsivity, by activating GABA-B receptors, now specifically in the central nucleus, we can decrease the central nucleus activity that accompanies compulsive self-administration, and we can also uh, suppress compulsive self-administration. So, I probably shouldn't take, I don't have time to take you to fantasy land, do I? <laughs> okay, two minutes fantasy land and then I'll wrap it up. So, so just, just the last, look, so, so all the stuff I've been talking about gives me hope that maybe I'll see a medication come to market. But even so, the medications we try to develop are really not disease modifying. There's persistent change in brain function in addiction we come up with ways to kind of push it back to a more normal state, but we don't address the fundamental changes in function. Is there a hope for disease modifying treatments? Maybe. Uh, so one of the mechanisms we've worked on in the lab for many years now is how epigenetic mechanisms lock in 
the neuro adaptations that develop over the course of developing addiction. And so the question becomes, can we target epigenetic enzymes to flip the switch back? And so one of our hottest projects, which they'll kill me for talking about, but I'm so excited I can't help myself, is this epigenetic enzyme, EZH2, which happens to be ex highly expressed in the central nucleus of animals that compulsively uh, self-administer alcohol. And in this case, we got lucky because the cancer people have already developed an EZH2 blocker. So what this enzyme does, it sets, it puts three methyl marks on histone three, uh, lysine 27, that is a repression signal. So that turns off gene expression very broadly. And there's a drug to block the enzyme. So we block the enzyme. We, these are compulsive rats uh, infused with saline, right? They stay compulsive. These are compulsive rats infused with uh, EZH2 inhibitor. Takes time. This is an epigenetic mechanism, right? You got to reprogram the transcriptome. Once you do that, they drop down to the level of non compulsive animals. Now, we don't know if that effect will stay. So, whether this is truly something that has the potential to be disease modifying, I have no idea. And by the way, Tazumetastat doesn't get into the brain unless you drill a hole through the blood brain barrier. And the medicinal chemists so far that we've worked with have miserably failed to modify the molecule in any way to make it enter the brain. So, you know, some seemingly simple, simple things like that can actually prevent the project from being successful as well. Okay, I'm done. Uh, let me just quickly remind you. So I think, I, I hope I have convinced you that the animal models that we've been using, including my own lab, may have limitations, but there is a stable minority of rats that displays these clinically central behaviors of choosing alcohol over natural rewards and also continuing to take alcohol despite negative consequences. We repeatedly are led back to GABAergic pathology in the central nucleus for both of those behaviors in the vulnerable animals. And I think this is a promising treatment target and GABA-B PANS would be something I, I, I hope to get to test in the clinic. And then the last thing I'll say is this work really has changed the way I treat addiction in patients. I don't know about you, but I was trained to, to believe that treating addiction is about making people stop, take drugs. It's not. If you do that, A, you're not going to succeed too often. B, if you do succeed, you'll end up very likely with a patient who's even more miserable than they were before. Addiction is about, treating addiction is about making sure that patients have available to them those healthy rewards and then using pharmacological and behavioral interventions to shift choice preferences back to those. Absent that, I don't think we can be successful. With that, I'll stop and take questions. Thank you very much.